and um, it's going to be a great morning. I feel like I was going to ask for a coffee and just and just have that whole heart that I was just going to have a coffee with you guys this morning, but I don't have a coffee over water. But that's what I was fe- that's what I felt like this morning. I'm just going to have a coffee with you and have a corridor. Let's have a talk. How about that? Because we're in the middle of Fano series, and I'm like, oh, I feel like. I miss the mark often in parenting. I don't know about anybody else, but sometimes I feel like, oh, did I just do that? Oh, my gosh. I hope I'm not the only one that's uh, said that. But anyway, before then, I just want to say to our Tūrangi whānau and our Wangaro whānau who are coming in live, they're streaming through the whole experience, I just want to say a big happy Mother's Day to all of you. Um, Wanganui, you beautiful wahine uh, ma down there, they actually having a umu. I know. I know. I saw the photos. I was like, oh, that's pretty flash. And I know, without a doubt, Turangi will be pulling out all the big guns. I heard they're having roast lamb. So... I just want to honour uh, all the women down in Turangi as well. Um, I know you are all blessed and uh, have, an, have a fabulous day. I want to just uh, share this uh, piece of scripture over all our women and all our wahine. And I know that sometimes um, Mother's Day can be a hard time for some people. And I knew, and I, sorry, I know that uh, in my earlier years of trying to um, conceive children and, and having miscarriages is that you always felt like a bit in my mind, like, oh, Mother's Day. But I want to just say that uh, even if you aren't a mother, there's going to come a time when you will be. Even our spiritual mums, even our mums that end up um, being the most huge blessing to children that are adopted into their life. Amen. But I want to just release this over our Fanganui, Fano, Turangi, Tito in the house. Taihape have Veronica preaching down there. Who knows what they're having for lunch? Probably some pasta from my father. Um, but I just, yeah, I, but I just want to say this. I want to say this. Ma i, ma i hoa koe e manaki, mana koe e tiaki. Ma ihoa e mea kia tiaho tona mata kia kwe, mana ano huki kwe e atafai. Ma, i, ma ihoa tona kanohi e fakara kia kwe, mana ana, ano e tuku te rangimarie kia kwe. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Numbers 6, 24 to 26. We need to be reminded of that. We need to be reminded that the Lord has us. That his that, that you know that we are, He is pleased with us. Some of us are too hard on ourselves. Some of us beat ourselves up when we get things wrong. Well, I'm here to say, you're going to get it wrong. So the quicker you get over it, the quicker you have a corridor with God, the quicker you have a corridor and talk to your kids, the better. I apologize to Zeke twice this week. Our son that is nonverbal. You know, I apologized to him twice this week because I got it wrong. And you're going to get it wrong. Um, I'll tell you a little story. A little while ago, I was getting my hair done, um, and um, one of the girls, it was so cool. It was such a cool question, and I'm glad she could ask, but I won't, yeah, I won't, like, she goes, do you ever lose your, mm, with the kids? You know, do I ever lose my crap with the kids? And the way she said, I just cracked up laughing. I was like, Yeah? I do. I ain't perfect. You know, there have been times when I've actually just lost it. But the losing it has sort of um, calmed down a bit. It's not as, it's not a 10 anymore. It's probably more like 6.5. My my family might think a bit different because Sam's wrote down one of her qualities, five qualities for her mum. I don't know if that was shared, is that I'm dramatic. (laughs) Any other dramatic mums in the house? (laughs) <laughs> but she put that as a quality. I'm like, oh, 
Thanks, Bubba. I'm dramatic. Um, but you know, it happens. You know, and, I, and, I, and James, he's funny. He's so good, eh? He sees me losing, throwing my toys, and he just sits there, and then I go and do all I need to do, and then I come back, and I'm like, oh, man, that was so bad. And I just went ahead and apologised to Zeke, and he just laughs. But I'm glad he lets me process it. Because the Holy Spirit, when you're in connection and relationship with Holy Spirit, He will pull you up just like that. And you have a choice to either listen then and there or go the long road, take the highway, and end up having to sort yourself out way down the track. But if you can deal uh, to it then and there, it saves the, I don't know, the pain. Anyway, so we're in a series, Fano series, and James last week talk, uh, spoke about the uh, commitments that you make as a parent. And there's 12 of them, and he did six. And I just want to say that it's not just for parenting. It's for life. It's for people that you lead, people that uh, you're an influence in your community. One of our team wrote up, a, um, who, who I know is not a parent, um, wrote how one of the values really helped them to shape how they were going to work with their team. So these are principles that aren't just for parenting, not just for that, but for life. And, and so last week, James spoke about our mistake and then our commitment. But he spoke about, I'm just going to briefly talk about the first six, is that projecting our lives onto our kids is a mistake that we do. But our commitment is to live a life that examples God's way. Number two, our mistake is we are inconsistent. But our commitment is be consistent in our lives and how we parent and lead. Our third mistake is we won't let our kids struggle. And our commitment was to prepare our kids to be resilient. Our fourth mistake is we value removing all pain. And our commitment was to guide their response through the pain. Number five, our mistake is we do it for them. It's not just parenting, eh? it's even when you're leading and you're training a team and you've got your work colleagues. But our commitment is be the consultant and not the contractor. Number six, the mistake was we prepare their path, but our commitment is to prepare them for their path. Those were the commitments last week. And so if you missed it, you can go on our YouTube channel and um, go back and watch them. But today I'm going to talk about the other six. And as I've been going through this, I've been having my own internal giggles because I could just see so many times how I'm like, oh, I don't do that. But not just in parenting, even in leadership sometimes, where you're still trying to do everything for them. You're trying to still um, make the path, or you're trying to still have too much control, in other words. Right? Cool. So, mistake number seven. We won't let our kids fail. We won't let them fail. We don't want our kids to fail at anything. Academics, sports, relationships, dance recitals, <laughs> or music. We just, we won't let them. However, what happens is, if along the way we remove that possibility of failure, they realise that they are in a foolproof world. That they'll never fail. But we know that there are things that happen when we fail through things. And I said fail through them, not fail and pull. So however, if along the way we remove the possibility of failure, they realise they are in a foolproof world. What happens is one, it prepares them for a world not like the one they will work in as an adult. Number two, it reduces their motivation to succeed. They lose their ambition to excel. They won't have the motivation to try something because we, we, we remove the opportunity for failure. Because who knows that when we fail, that we can learn from those things, that we can grow, that we can strengthen, that we can build a capacity to move forward. 
If all we ever did was allow our kids to win at everything, they'd lose their motivation to even want to try anything else because there's been no stretch. If life was so easy, there'd be no stretch for any of us. We'd be so comfortable. We've got to push ourselves. Amen? As parents, we confuse hurt with harm. We all get hurt feelings, but it doesn't harm. Like, we've got to talk them through it. I'm talking about, like, that physical harm. Like, we get it all muddled up. Real growth only happens when we're learning to deal with it, with failure and through it. We need to help our children navigate through those hurt, hurt moments, through the feelings, through those, um, those awkward moments, you know, when kids talk about their friends, when adults talk about their friends. In Proverbs uh, chapter 22, verse 6, it says, Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Great opportunity to start them off to realign. I love it. James mentioned it last week and he talked about 2 Corinthians 12, 9, 10 and it's about um, God's grace being sufficient but before that it talks about um, how Paul had a thorn in his side and I love it how the message version says because of the extravagance and I apologise, I didn't have a slide there for this because of the extravagance of those revelations and so I wouldn't get a big head. I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch with my limitations. Satan's angel did his best to keep me down. In verse 7 in the NIV it says, I was given a thorn in my flesh from a messenger of Satan to torment me. I pleaded three times for the Lord to take it away. But he said to me in verse 9, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in my weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. In verse 10, That is why for Christ's sake I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. If we can't teach our children or help navigate someone that we're close to, that when, they're, when they fail, when they experience these things, that in their weakness, they will be strong. God will strengthen them. Not you, but God. Not your grace, but His his grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. It's really, really important. It's actually that important that even in the message, it talked about so that Paul wouldn't get a big head because he's all that. You know, sometimes if we don't allow our kids to fail, they, their head might start to expand. And they think they're all that. We've seen it. We could probably think of somebody straight away off the bat in our family, in a close circle, or a friend. I mean, you could, you could name somebody that they think they're all that. But when we go through these hard moments, this is an opportunity to learn how to fail forward. So our commitment is permit them to try new things even if they fail. That is our commitment to our children. That is our commitment to those around us. Allow them to try new things. Don't restrict. Don't project, like James talked about last week, like what you're going through, that's going to stop them from trying something new. Your fear or your insecurity. Here are some tips. Talk through with them what's been happening. Like talk it through with them. Help them to walk, uh, to work through their hurt, which over time will, will build a resilient kid. 
which over time will, will build a resilient friend. Our mistake number eight. We prioritise being happy. You know, this is, um, all these commitments is something like James shared that is what we walked through with Psalms for her 10th birthday and we made a video. And um, it was really, really challenging for me because we get so uh, used to hearing a lot of this terminology uh, like this one here. It says, we prioritise being happy. Um, the, a lot of the statements that we hear often are, you won't be happy if you do that. It doesn't make me happy when you talk like that. Stop your attitude and just be happy. Are you sure he's the right one? Are you happy? And we put such an emphasis and a priority on being happy. And when I read this, I was going, oh, that's confusing in my brain. But as I started to read the devotion and to study more, I was like, oh, I get it. I get it. We say many things that lead our children to believe that happiness is the ultimate goal. If, if uh, It's everywhere. It's in culture. It's in school. It's in friends. The happily ever after story. If life isn't about being happy, then what is it about? Here's a quote um, from a psychologist, Dr. I don't even know how to say his name, Mahali. Anyway, I say that. Life satisfaction occurs most often when people are engaged in absorbing activities that cause them to forget about themselves, lose track of time, and stop worrying. In other words, it's not just about you. Here's the commitment. Help your children to discover their gifts and strengths to serve others. Others, when your mind is taken off this illusion of happiness, but focused on others, there is greater satisfaction because happiness comes out of it. Here are the scriptures. And I was like, that is so true. When I serve others, when I bless others, when I put, when I love on others, it, it brings a deep sense of contentment. Like I'm just like, ooh. In Matthew 22, verse 37 to 39, it says this, Jesus replied, Love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this, Love your neighbor as yourself. In 1 Peter 4, 10, it says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. We are to model who Jesus is for our children. We are to help our children discover their gifts and who they are to serve others. You know, when I sit down and pray with Psalms, we actually spend most of the time praying and blessing others. It's always actually, our prayers are always about other people. It's not just about us. It's about who's God put on our heart that we're going to pray and we're going to bless and love on. In John 13, 12 to 14, it says, When he had finished washing his feet, washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand that I have, what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. If it was good enough for Jesus to wash their feet, it is good enough for us to wash other people's feet. Our job is to, ro is to role model who Jesus was. When it wasn't about himself, it was about others. And that's where true life satisfaction came from. If you haven't tried it, try it this week. Use your gift. Use what's your passion and serve someone else. And then tell me, how did you feel? What happened for you? 
there are heaps of cool stories of people that just, you know, those ones that love to give gifts. I love, I actually love giving people gifts. I just want to see them open it up. It just makes my day. You know, when I go shopping, I went shopping the other day um, for Mother's Day, for the mothers. Um, I had all these people's um, names running through my head. Oh, I should buy that for Charity. I should buy that for Alicia. I should buy that for, you know, I'm like, I just getting excited because I wanted to buy all these things. But I didn't have a budget. So I'm, I don't have my, I didn't have a budget. But like, I just wanted to, I, all I could think of all these people I could buy for. And I just wanted to do it. But I, I held my, control of my impulses. Um, stick to the budget. Another message. But our job is to help our children discover, because that's where they're going to find their happiness from. Because feelings come and go, but when you act outside of your emotions and you serve someone, something does happen in the inside of us. Amen? So if we can teach our children to serve others, what a great tool for their life to set them up. I feel like it's all rolling in with the giving message and everything, eh? It's just so beautiful. Mistake number nine. We remove the consequences. Honestly, when I was preparing this message, I'm like, man, this is me, this is me, this is me. I hope someone else is thinking the same. (laughs) This is a description of consequences. Your head is pounding. You're trying to get something done, so you take a pain reliever. The next day, it happens again. It's a busy week, so you pop another. You notice some minor congestion the next day and a worsening headache. Instead of resting, you take another. We ignore symptoms in life, and over time, we create a temporary ease by removing the consequences of being sick. We actually increase our long-term suffering. Get that all in there. Think about that. If you do this, this is the benefit. If you do that, this is the consequence, and you allow our decisions to play out. This will help our children. Don't remove the consequences when things happen. Same for leadership. Same for your employees. Don't remove the consequences Follow through. Follow through with them. It may be painful to watch. It may hurt a little bit. It may be very inconvenient. You may even feel sorry. Little story. I say to my daughter every time, Baba, if you eat all your Pringles... In the first couple of days, darling, the consequence is you won't have any snacks for morning tea for school for the rest of the week because you know mum shops once a week. Yes, mum. It is so hard to not go out and replace them when she eats them. It is really hard, eh? Hey? Yeah. Hey, eh, mums? Yeah. You're like, oh, she ate them all. Go and buy some more. <laughs> I'm like, oh. Well, there's some pretty hardcore mums in here. Or there's, that, there's, a, there's a scenario where your children, you give them boundaries for the iPad, right? You say, you can have the iPad, but these are the things that we've decided as a family for a value that we are not going to watch. Um, you know what will happen. There's a consequence if you do watch these things. And my daughter's actually barred off her iPad at home currently. And you know, sometimes the easiest thing when you're busy... And you got visitors, just quickly go get the iPad. But this week, all week, I'm like, oh, you're not allowed on the iPad. That's right. Okay, so let me think about that. What's going to happen? For a whole week, she's like, when am I allowed on my iPad? When am I allowed on my iPad? Now, she doesn't even ask for her iPad. Because she understood that there was a value in our home. And there is a consequence. And we're following through with it. Our commitment to our children is to teach your children the consequences of their choices. Teach them about them. Here are some tips. Less rules and more equations. You're like, what's that? I'm like, yeah, I'm learning too. Less rules and more equations. 
if this is what you do, this is what happens, your choice kind of scenario. Ask me next week if I keep topping up the Pringles, okay? <laughs> Follow through with the equations. The sooner we face them, the smaller they are, the consequences. If we deal with things straight away, they don't get so big, like the headache. And I love this, parent for the long term, not the short term. It's very inconvenient when you're trying to parent and you know you've got to follow through and you're busy and you've got stuff to do. Things are happening, but we've got to follow through. It's the same in the workplace. You know there's this job that needs to be done, but you to take your hands off because someone else has to do it. They've got to do it. And if they don't do it, there's a consequence. And you know eventually something else is going to happen. We've got to actually let it all play through. Otherwise, no one learns. No one discovers that, oh, I don't have the capacity for that. Oh, maybe I shouldn't be doing that. Let's give that to someone else. Oh, mum, I know now that I shouldn't do that because that means I'm going to have nothing for lunch the next day. I'm like, oh, girl, you're getting it. Still ask me next week, though. But we've got to follow through, and we've got to teach them there is a consequence. If you're going to spend all your pocket money on lollies, the consequence is you forego the potential of buying your squishmallow. This is real stuff, guys. <laughs> Squishmallow is on the I want to buy list, or the uri. So if you're going to spend all your pocket money on one thing, if you're not allocating anything towards your wish list, you're going to forego the uri for winter. You'll probably end up with it in summer. <laughs> but this is what happens in real life. We want to teach them about consequences same as adults. This isn't just a parent message. But here's a prayer for us. Father, are there any consequences or areas I need discipline in that I'm putting off in my own life? Will you point out ways I can parent the way you are, prepare, you are parenting me? When you start asking God questions like that, be prepared for the answer. Be real. You can be real with him. He already knows. In Galatians 6, 6 to 9, it says this, Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will, will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for all at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. It's teaching our children there is a consequence. What you sow, you shall reap. In Ephesians 6, 4, in the message, it says, Fathers, fathers, don't frustrate your children with no-win scenarios. Take them by the hand and lead them through in the way of the master. Mothers and fathers, let's be a parent, a leader, a colleague, a friend that helps them, helps them to understand this scenario. Take them by the hand and lead them the way of the master. Is this helping somebody today? So good. All right, mistake number 10. We lie, this is, I always laugh about this kind of stuff. We lie about their potential and we don't explore their true potential. Why I'm laughing, you'll find out soon. When we praise our children for the wrong things, it can create an illusion. E.g., you're awesome. You're awesome. You're awesome. All the time, you're awesome. Oh, you're awesome. Our kids will become disillusioned unless they are first illusioned. I'm talking about, like, the wrong kind of praise. I laugh a little bit because, you know, sometimes you watch 
I haven't watched for a little very, for years. Um, you know, the program like American Idol or the sing shows, and and they get on, they can't sing, and, and but someone has told them they can sing. So they've been lied to, and it's and it's actually quite like, oh, that's not good. But I bet you they have a gifting in some other part and area of their life that needed the encouragement to be nurtured and brought through, but someone decided to lie about their potential in singing. So in our household, if you're flat, you're flat. You ain't awesome and you ain't amazing. Oh, that, that's off. Wrong harmony. There's no lying when it comes to singing in our house. I don't know why we do it. We lie about their potential. Everybody in our house knows that Psalms is not a sports person. She is not a touch player. We've tried, the coach, and I'm the manager, and we go to touch, you know, we commit as a family, and she's on the field, and she's like, <laughs> you know, and James like, just turn around, bubble the ball. And me and James are like touch players. You know, we love sports. And then after the season, he's like, Bubba, you don't play touch. Oh, Dad. <laughs> don't sign us up again. <laughs> Let's just be real and save the pain. <laughs> She's not going to be on the rugby field, the touch field, the netball court. She's going to be in art class <laughs> where the heat pumps are. No sad day sport. But this is what happens. We go around lying about their potential. That is a mistake we do. And um, I was doing some research, and what now uh, some of the research has been proven is that there is now, the, there's a midlife crisis, right, at 50. Now, all of a sudden, there is a quarter-life crisis, 25-year-olds in therapy, depression, things are going on in their world, things are happening, they're in therapy for depression, maybe they didn't have the right spouse or that hasn't happened for them, they haven't made their first million dollars in the first quarter of their life, they're not getting the jobs that they want, I want to be CEO at 25. They have such high expectations that they're going to achieve and reach all their milestones that they have not been gifted in or someone's lied about their potential or something's happening. But just hearing about that there's a quarter life crisis, that breaks my heart. So our commitment to our children is to help discover and affirm your child's gifts Help to discover and affirm. And the other one we wrote down is, which means I won't lie. If you're not a touch player, you're not a touch player. Now let's be real. So here are some tips. Face the difficult conversations. Have them now. Even your colleagues, you know, sometimes if they ask, ask for permission to be real. Do I have permission to speak honestly? And it's all with the attitude of the heart, eh? Like, check what's going on in here. If you're saying something because it's going to make you feel good, then it's the wrong motive. But if you're saying something to, to help them navigate through something that they're doing, to bless them, to, to honour them, then that's different again. Tip number two, genuinely, genuinely and sincerely praise your children. And I'm going to give you... Um, some examples later on, which means I won't praise wrong things or carelessly. I'm going to praise them differently. And here's a table that we're going to put up. I think I'll put it up. And this is what happens in the first five years at home. We tell them, you are loved, you are safe, you are valuable, you are uniquely gifted, and you are supported. In the first five years. In the last five years, we say life is difficult. You're not in control. You're not that important. Your life is not about you, and you're going to die one day and leave a legacy. Right. 
But put it all into context. Life is difficult, and the word, word talks about that. In this world, you will have, you're going to have them. So it's going to be difficult. God is in control. God is a part of their journey. And sometimes we get so self-absorbed that it's all about us, but it's not. And that's that whole thing of teaching them to serve others. Otherwise, we always think it's us. And that you're going to die one day and leave a legacy. Everything we do in life is about leaving a legacy. And not creating fear around one day you're going to die. We say to our girl, oh, if there was a volcano eruption and Topo erupted, where are we going to drive to, Baba? No way, Mum, we'll be all in heaven. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, have those open conversations. In Ephesians 4, 14 to 16, it says, Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every word of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Verse 15, instead speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Verse 16, from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. I love the first part that we would not be tossed back and forth and blown here and there. Every kind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Fano, let's not lie about their potential. Let's help them on their journey. As parents, as leaders, even if you're not a parent in here now, you're still part of the village that connects with all our children and all our tamariki. My expectation would be if you saw something out of character for my daughter, uh, my expectation is that you should be able to go, excuse me, Psalms, and have a all. That's okay, because we're a, a village of Fano helping to bring up our children together. Don't come and tell me next week, oh, I saw Psalms, and I'll be like, oh, did you see it? Did you talk to her? In love, of course. Don't have a high tone. Don't shout. <laughs> She'll run away. But 11, our mistake number 11, here we go. We give them what they should earn. Sometimes we feel as parents we should be giving everything that they want. Anybody felt like that? We start to produce teenagers, young adults that start to feel entitled for things because it's always been given to them. And when I think about some things, I'm like, oh, I should probably stop doing that. You know, sometimes as parents, kids lose their new shoes in the first week. And you're like, I can't send them off without any more shoes. I'll go and buy some new ones. Now, for me, like my daughter lost her jersey, I'm like, I'm not buying another one. You can go to lost property every day and try and look for it, and I'm not buying another one. Because there ends up being no value, and they just feel entitled that it's just everything's going to get replaced if something happens. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah? <laughs> Paul writes to the Thessalon Thessalonica church to address some issues he noticed. Great English. Including misunderstanding of Christ's return. There were some Christians who actually quit their jobs to prepare for it. Paul sharply addressed this specific issue in chapter in 2 Thessalonians 3 and 6 to 11. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. He follows up by pointing out that the same people who are not working are getting mixed up in the wrong business. And it says this in verse 6, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, the brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching 
you received from us. For you, for you yourselves know you, are, you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you. In verse 8, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Verse 9, we did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. Verse 10, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Verse 11, we hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy, they are busy bodies. How does this apply to my parenting? When we give our kids what they should earn, we remove from them the, priv the privilege of working for it. When we give our kids what they should earn, we remove from them the privilege of working for it. Working not only provides the benefits of earnings, but it also keeps us from going into dangerous territory. Where that scripture talks about disruption, idleness, busybodies. And I thank my father wholeheartedly and my mother that from a very young age, I think like 12, I worked in the family restaurant business, Friday night shift, Saturday day, or a Saturday night shift, Sunday, or a Sunday night shift, where I had to work. There was no room for me to have idleness, to have disruption, and to be a busybody. I had the privilege of understanding what it was to earn something. I had the honour and the privilege to understand what delayed gratification is. Some of us have made it way too easy for our children. Some of us have made it way too easy for our work colleagues. Some of us just make it too easy. Our commitment to our children is to teach your kids the art of working and Waiting. This is the art. Same with anybody that we're involved in. Here is a tip. Plan some age-appropriate ways that you could help your children learn the importance of work. You know, all these parenting tips take time, take commitment, take consistency. It can be the most convenient thing you have to do is to stop what you're doing and to follow through with your values. We're all, everybody's busy. But I reckon we've got to remove some of the noise and really hone in what God is saying about these commitments for our children. Because if we don't set them up, the world is going to set them up. If we don't instill what God wants to release into their lives, then the world is the one that's going to be training up our children and they will be having a quarter life crisis. Psalms had a goal when she was a little bit younger about a scooter. And we said, if, we, if you can save for a year for your scooter, we'll meet you halfway. And we put up the chart and we coloured it in. So it took her a whole year to save, I think it was like $80. She was a bit younger. But it was teaching her that one day, after all that work, she would receive her scooter. And then when she received it, there was such an appreciation for it and an understanding of having to work and wait. We live in such a microwave mentality society today where everything is instant. 30 seconds, a minute, everything is just like, this is this whole instant kind of mentality. Fast fashion, you know, there's just like everything is just coming at you. But God's way, marinating, allowing things to, you know, the flavors to blend together, creates a different kind of expectation that you're waiting because you know that when it's about that time to cook and to eat, you've been waiting 
for that reward, that taste to hit your taste buds. I would prefer the work and the wait than the fast 30-second microwave mentality where half the time anything that's like that is chewy anyway. Hey. But I want what God has for me. Proverbs 13, 4 says, A sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. Come on. Mistake number 12, and my last one. Number 12, we praise the wrong things. And I loved studying this because it's so true. A Dr. Carroll, who is a professor at Stanford and has completed a lot of work around motivation and growth mindset, discovered, um, has been diving into why people succeed or don't and what's within our control to foster success. And she was seeing that how people have praised people over the years actually hasn't been reaping the right uh, kind of fruit. So what she said was 85% of parents believe they should tell their children you must be a smart kid, as we believe it will provide them with confidence for when they next take a test at school. You're smart. The doctor had a suspicion that it was backfiring, so she created an experiment with two groups. Ten-year-old children were split, split into two groups, completing the same test. We all know how powerful, word, how powerful words are, right? So the first group... She said, you are smart. She affirmed their smarts. The second group, they said, you, uh, you must have really tried hard. So, so they affirmed their effort when they took the test. From that, the first group more failed in the first group than the second group. And the second test that they took, the grade, the test was two grades higher than the original. Almost all of them said that they didn't want to take the test. They didn't want to think that they were, they didn't think they were smart enough to take the test because all the praise was honed in on your smart. But the kids in the second group, they all, they were affirmed by their efforts and they all took the test happily because they were affirmed by their efforts and not because they were smart. When they did the third test, the first group, 30% of them did way worse because they were continuously affirmed on their smarts and not their effort. When, when you affirm variables that are not of their control, you produce a fixed mindset. So our commitment is this, affirm variables within your child's control. And there's going to be a chart coming up. And I'm learning, because you know how sometimes you just say things and you're like, there's no depth to that. This is what we do as parents, and we can as anybody. We praise fixed features. You're beautiful, you know, that kind of thing. Your hair's pretty. Um, we praise carelessly with no depth. Our praise doesn't match their performance. That's that whole thing about the potential thing too, eh? But here is a praise correction. When we praise fixed features, instead we should praise what's in their control. So now I'm starting to think about what I'm praising Psalms for. Instead of like, oh, you're a good girl. Psalms, I just, I just want to praise you for how you, you just did all that without me even asking you. And thank you for being so helpful. And like, there's just certain things that she's starting to do now because the praise is different, right? When we praise carelessly, instead we should be genuine and sincerely interested. Now this is going to take some time out of your day. This is going to take engagement. This is going to, and you can do this with your work colleagues too, eh? But when you learn how to praise your colleagues, it just shifts the dynamics in the office. You know, it's not just flippant, oh, you're awesome, cool top. Like, it's, you, start to, you start to go a little bit deeper than that. Hey, I really love the response that you formulated in that email. 
to our stakeholders. It really taught me something about how I can engage with them as well. Our praise doesn't match the performance. Instead, our praise should all add up. And this is my, I've been practicing this intentionally this week. Not just for my daughter, but for those that we lead and we influence. For those that I'm in the marketplace with and working with. Because it changes, it changes the response that you're going to get. And it helps them. It affirms them. This is all homework. It's not, it's, it's, it can get hard, eh? All right, here's a prayer. Holy Spirit, will you help me to see the unique strengths and virtues of my child? Will you nudge me daily to encourage them in meaningful ways? What a good prayer. And I ask that for anybody else that's in my sphere of influence. I want to be that person that praises genuinely, honestly. If I tell you your top's nice, it, it is. I do think more about it, about you. But I want to be that person that just goes a little bit deeper. In Hebrews 3.13, it says this, but encourage one another daily as long as it, as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Encourage one another on a daily basis. Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. When you get deflated, you just don't know the power of an encouraging word that's going to inflate you. So you think about people in your world that you see, your children, when you see them going off to school a bit deflated or a little bit concerned about something and you speak a word that's going to uplift them, it changes things. Hebrews 10, 24. And let, let, us consider, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Powerful to think about the words that you speak. The words that you say have such heavy weight behind them. So here's a little recap, and then we're going to pray. Permit them to try new things even when they fail. Help our children to discover their gifts and strengths to serve others. Teach our children the consequences of their choices. Help discover and affirm your child's gifts. Teach your kids the art of working and waiting. Affirm variables within your child's control. These are the last six commitments. I really pray and hope that this has brought an encouragement to you. And I love what one of our teams said last week. I'm not a parent, but those, but those commitments actually helped them navigate with one of their team. God's values and his principles are for all. And I want to be a parent that's going to value these commitments. They were my fridge, by the way, because this was our, our promise, our commitment to Psalms for the next three years while she's 10. By the time she's 13, our heart is to continuously commit to her in these areas so that we can really, you know, foundationally set her up for life. Because there's going to come a time you release them and you allow them to make their mistakes. You allow them to walk through their consequences. You allow them to fail. But our job is to just be on that journey with them. Why don't we stand this morning? Thank you, Turangi and Wanganui, for coming in live. I pray that you are encouraged hugely. We're all on a journey of learning, discovering, growing constantly. And I love how God always wants the best for us. He wants to challenge us. He wants us to grow. 
He allows us to go through, you know, those moments of hurt and pain, but He doesn't leave us. He takes us through it. So be encouraged that whatever your children walk through, know that God is with you and for you. Whatever you're walking through, God is with you and for you. Some of us need a real encounter, a a revelation of how real and how intimate God wants to be with us on this journey. Even knowing we're going to make mistakes and we're going to get it wrong. For those that aren't parents, our young ones, you have the opportunity to, to really like take these on board, start to implement them with your workmates or wherever you are. Be aware of them. Be conscious of them. But our heart is that you would engage with these commitments, that you'd take them on board, that you would engage with Holy Spirit as you go on this journey of parenting. And I just want to honour you all and thank you that as a church, as a hahi, we're raising a village together. We're doing this together. And we've got to take comfort in that. There will be people in this church that may influence my daughter in a way that I could never. And I'm going to honour them for that. There may be people in this church, in this hahi, that my daughter may want to run to, to talk to, more than maybe me at some point in her life. And that's okay too. James shares about that. When he was a youth, he'd run to Brian and Lee's all the time. So when we have an open heart to what God values about these commitments... You're preparing for, you just don't know who's going to run to you. I think that's exciting. Coming into church this morning and Marley's just running at me. I'm like, girl, you're full of fire. She keeps me in check. I had her for lunch a couple of weeks ago and we were on a holiday. But Ezekiel and I stayed home and she was like, where were you? Why weren't you at church today? I was like, oh, how do I answer that? She was like, come on. Like, That's so awesome. Keeping me in check. But I love it. There's like this village around this beautiful girl. And she knows it because when we come into the house, like she's greeting everybody like auntie, uncle. <laughs> That's what it's about. So beautiful. Why don't we just pray? Let's close our eyes. Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for this series, Lord God. These 12 commitments that we've spoke about last week and this week. Father, I thank you that you've taken us all on a journey together. Lord, that we're all a work in progress. That we're all developing and learning, growing together. And Lord, I know we're going to get it wrong. But I know just as quick as we get it wrong, it's going to be just as fast to get back on track. Father, I thank you that when we do get it wrong, you whisper gently and say, hey, let's just change the angle on that or hey, let's apologize. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for this word. That it's not a word of condemnation, but it's a word word that's just going to, to maybe take demystify what parenting is actually about that we are all custodians of our children that they've been given to us for a moment but they belong to you Father I thank you for every parent in this house every parent in Turangi and Wanganui and for those that are watching online I just thank you that you breathe on us Lord Father afresh breathe on us afresh, you know, just what we've been receiving over the last couple of weeks. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord, for what you are doing. And with our eyes still closed, and for those watching online, if there's anybody that's here today, and maybe this is your first time into the house, maybe it's your first time watching online, 
and you don't and you are not in a relationship with God and maybe you don't even know what it is to be in relationship with him but all he wants is for us to engage in with him and acknowledge that he is not just a savior but he is a lord that there are things that we've done in our lives that have kept us separated from him but he wants us to be reconciled back to his heart and it's as simple as saying lord i want that I want to be connected, my heart to yours, and go on a journey of faith with you. If you're here this morning and that's you, I want you to raise your hand, or if you're online, or if you're in Turangi or Wangaroi, just raise your hand and one of the team will see that and will come and pray with you. But if that's you this morning, just raise your hand today and that would be awesome. He delights. Thank you, I see that hand. He delights. He delights in you. And even if you walked away and you chose a different path for a moment and you said, actually, I just want to come back to you, He still delights in you. He still delights. So, Father, we thank you for those that have acknowledged you and want to be connected back to you. We thank you, Father, that you would take them on that journey of learning and growing in their faith and in who they are. We thank you, Jesus. So if that's you, and you put your hand up, one of the team will connect with you. And one of the team will walk you through. Amen.